Hello, today we're going to talk about reactivity 3.2.7 and 3.2.8. So we'll talk about um, secondary cells or rechargeable cells and electrolytic cells with more depth. So remember that electrolytic cells have redox reactions and um, we've talked about voltaic cells, which are spontaneous and produce electrical energy, and then electrolytic cells, which are non-spontaneous and consume electrical energy. So rechargeable cells are what we call secondary cells. Secondary. And they involve reversible redox reactions. So that way, um, it can go in the forward direction or reverse direction, spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And the um, most important kind of use of this are in rechargeable batteries. And we'll look at a couple examples of these, um, but the, the biggest thing you need to know is that they are reversible redox reactions. So a really common example of a um, secondary cell or a rechargeable cell is a lithium ion battery. Um, and so typically you'll have a lithium electrode, some kind of um, polymer with an electrolyte in it. And then um, a lithium metal oxide. Okay, so a lot of times you'll see uh, manganese, but it's going to be some kind of metal oxide in there. And this is our other electrode. And in here, this is going to be the negative. And you'll also typically have an inert, like a graphite electrode in there. Um, and the uh, lithium with the metal oxide is going to be serve as a positive electrode. And a lot of times you'll see the electrons going this way, and this is when the cell is being discharged. So in this case, when the electrons are traveling um, towards the positive electrode, that means that this is acting as the anode where the lithium will be oxidized. And this is sir, the positive side is serving as the cathode where um, reduction is happening. Um, but you can force it to go in the reverse direction by applying electrical energy. So that's like when you, you know, plug in your cell phone to charge it. It's going to force it back in the opposite direction. Um, and in that case, you'll basic, you're basically like reloading the lithium back up with electrons um, so that it can, when it's unplugged, discharge those electrons again, um, which is really cool. So let's take a second to talk about fuel cells. Fuel cells are not considered secondary cells because they're not rechargeable like we talked about with the lithium ion battery. Um, there's some kind of fuel that is consumed during the process. Um, so a major example of that is a hydrogen fuel cell. But you can have combustion of different things. It's just a, a good example here because it's a common one. If you combust hydrogen gas and oxygen and typically we'll, we'll refer to uh, it in terms of one hydrogen molecule. So you'll need half of an oxygen molecule to react with it. And when it does that, it will form water. And at room temperature, it'll be a liquid. And when it does that, it releases a whole bunch of energy. Um, and just looking at uh, for standard conditions, the heat of formation of liquid water like that is um, negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. That is in your data booklet. Um, but effectively, if you keep supplying hydrogen and oxygen from the air, then you can um, continually make water and produce and release this heat energy as your um, energy source. And of course, this is just another type of redox reaction because the hydrogen and oxygen are starting at an oxidation state of zero. The hydrogen is changing to a plus one oxidation state. The oxygen is changing to a negative one oxidation, negative two oxidation state. So the hydrogen is going up, it's being oxidized, and the oxygen is going down, it's being reduced. Um, so this is another way to harness redox reactions to produce energy for us.
So let's kind of um, recap some of our different electro, uh, electrochemical cells and their advantages and disadvantages. So in general, we've got our primary cells, um, which are the you know typical voltaic cell, which are the, like the not rechargeable batteries. Um, but the, so they, they tend to be less expensive, but they are consumable. They're consumed, so um, you can't reuse them. They're a little harder on the environment that way because you have to find some way to dispose of them. Um, another primary cell would be a fuel cell, like a hydrogen fuel cell, which um, you know is going to be a pretty efficient way of generating a lot of energy, um, but it tends to be a little bit more expensive, and um, it can be fairly dangerous, especially if you're using hydrogen as the fuel, um, because hydrogen is explosive. So you need to be very careful with how you're using that, the hydrogen and storing the hydrogen and transporting the hydrogen. Um, so that, those are some disadvantages there. Um, when we're talking about our secondary cells, we have um, like lithium ion batteries, um, or you can even have like lead acid batteries, um, which are like batteries in your car. Um, but the lead acid battery tends to be a little bit more dangerous um, just due to the nature of it. It does produce a lot of energy very quickly. Um, however, eventually it will degrade over time. I mean, any of the secondary cells will degrade over time. But um, you have more issues like disposing of lead acid batteries than you will some of the other types. And um, with lithium ion batteries, they do have a longer... Um, I mean, higher cost. So they tend to be a little, little bit more expensive. They do degrade over time. Um, so they have like a limited lifespan involved with them. Um, I've heard tales of them exploding under certain conditions, like lighting on fire, um, which can be dangerous. Um, however, because it doesn't have a heavy metal like lead or like cadmium or nickel, um, it's a little bit less dangerous in that respect. Um, so all of these have their, their benefits, like um, reusability versus um, expense versus environmental impact when they are um, like completely used up. So uh, depending on the situation, you might choose one or another. Now let's get a little bit more specific with electrolytic cells. We've already talked about um, voltaic cells in a lot of detail. Electrolytic cells are different because they are non-spontaneous. They require a power source, some kind of power source. You could hook it up to a battery. So like you could connect a voltaic cell to an ele electrolytic cell. You could also like plug it into the wall if you have a power source that way. Um, so you need some kind of power source. And we typically will represent the power source using this notation here. So you'll have a, um, your wire like this. And this represents, this center part here represents the power source. The longer line is always the positive, and the smaller line is the negative. And um, for electrolytic cells, remember that it is flip-flopped from a voltaic, and the positive side is the anode. The negative side is the cathode. And um, so this will be, you know, attached, the wire will be attached to electrodes. And, um, if you remember back to voltaic cells, usually they're depicted in two separate containers with a salt bridge. Very frequently, you're going to have just one container for electrolytic, so that's the most common depiction, and it's in an electrolyte solution that way. And also, very frequently, the electrodes themselves are inert. Very common. Not always. Um, sometimes the uh, electrodes are going to be part of the reaction. But um, sometimes you'll be using inert electrodes, things like graphite. Um, graphite conducts electricity well, but does not typically participate in the redox reaction. Now, um, if your electrodes are inert, that means whatever your the redox reaction is, is happening in the electrolyte solution there. Um, one example of that would be something like a molten salt, um, like sodium chloride but you can use other salts as well. 
and in this case the salt would be um, forming in a sodium and then chlorine gas like this. So that's an example um, of an electrolytic process. Uh, another example, you can even split water. So um, water, if you put electricity into water, it will split um, the water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and that's another really common one. Um, typically, you'll, you'll be able to, well, either you'll be able to see bubbles forming at the two electrodes. Um, if, if you're forming or if you're starting with water and you're splitting water, you'll see the bubbles forming. But sometimes they will use a um, some kind of container to trap the gases. And then you'll see that twice as much hydrogen gas is formed as oxygen gas because of that two to one ratio. Okay, so um, this one, it says deduce the half reactions that occur at the anode and cathode in the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell in acidic conditions. Um, so we talked about the fact that hydrogen is going to react with oxygen um, to form water. So we can actually split this into two half reactions, hydrogen going into water and um, oxygen gas going into water. Now, this is kind of interesting because you have to um, balance the oxygens using water is kind of funny um, and then there are you need to, there's two additional hydrogen ions that need to be added and two electrons so the waters kind of cancel out here so you have hydrogen gas turning into hydrogen ions and two electrons and I know this seems just a little bit backwards but it, it's the easiest way so you always apply the same rules no matter what for the um, oxygen half reaction you have um, oxygen gas and we want to make sure that we have two waters being formed so we have two, the oxygens are balanced and that means it's going to require four hydrogen ions and to balance the charge you'll need four electrons then so um, our half reaction for the oxygen is o2 plus four h plus plus four electrons yields two h2o um, and yeah, so then th that was the end of this question because it just wanted the half reactions. But if you wanted to continue, you would multiply the hydrogen side by two so the electrons match and put them together into the overall. So this question wants us to suggest an advantage and a disadvantage of a methanol fuel cell over a lead acid battery. Um, so methanol as a fuel, um, we talked more about hydrogen in this lesson, but methanol also works because you can combust methanol, and that combustion will produce CO2 and H2O, 2H2O. Um, now, so one advantage of it is it is a fairly efficient process. It produces a good amount of energy. Um, it's also going to have less environmental pollutants in terms of heavy metal, so it doesn't have a heavy metal source that could get into the environment. However, it does produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct, which is a pollutant. Um, so you've got kind of a trade-off there. So it is efficient, but it produces carbon dioxide. So depending on um, like the usage of this, you might choose one or the other. Um, another thing you have to consider is how are you going to transport and contain the methanol because it is a gas and um, a fairly combustible gas, right? So that could be a disadvantage as well, that it, it's harder to transport and store. Okay, so this one, um, describe the reactions that occur at the two electrodes during the electrolysis of molten lead to bromide. Write the equation for the overall and then comment on any likely changes. So we have our lead two plus ions because it's molten, so it's broken up into ions. And um, over the course of this reaction, it's going to gain electrons and form solid lead. The bromide, on the other hand, starts at a negative one charge, and it's going to release an electron and bromine, produce bromine liquid. And actually, it'll do two to get that to balance properly. Now, um, the overall reaction then would be our 
lead ions and our bromide ions, producing solid lead and bromine liquid. And this is molten, so liquid. The lead is a solid. And then any changes that would be observable. So the um, molten lead to bromide is a, you know, it'll be a liquid ionic solution, very, very hot at this point. But um, you are changing from these things that are liquid to solid lead. Actually, it might be liquid depending on how hot it is. It didn't give us enough information to, to be able to tell. Um, but then you are also going to be forming bromine liquid, which is a brown liquid. And you should know the color of that. Um, so you'll, you will see a change in color there. You might see a change in state depending on the temperature. But you are definitely going to uh, be observing these elements that were in their ionic form now in their elemental form um, as a product of that electrolysis. So this one wants us to write half equations for the electrode reactions occurring during the electrolysis of molten magnesium fluoride using graphite electrodes. Remember, these are inert. So our magnesium ions are going to be reduced, gain electrons, and form solid magnesium. They are reduced at the cathode, which is the negative electrode for electrolysis. The two fluoride ions um, are going to be oxidized, and you will form fluorine gas and the two electrons. And this occurs at the anode which is the positive electrode for electrolysis. OK, so this links back to um, reactivity 2.3. Secondary cells rely on electrode reactions that are reversible. What are some common features of these reactions? Well, if they're reversible, they are going to have um, equilibrium constants. And if they are going to be easily reversible, you want your K value to be close to 1. It's not going to be exactly 1, but it's going to be closer to 1. The, the smaller the value of K, the more it wants to favor the reactants, and the larger the value of K, the more it's going to favor the products. Um, so that's, we, we want our secondary cells to have a, a value of K that is reasonable, that it is easy enough to um, push it in the forward or the reverse direction depending on the scenario, whether we are trying to discharge or recharge the cell. Um, in that same vein, since this is a redox reaction, we also want, um, if we're looking at activity series, we want the activities of the metals to be close. They can't be the same or else you wouldn't produce enough energy for it to be useful, but you still want them to be close enough that you can apply energy to get it to um, recharge, and it can also discharge. Um, so you want the, the scenario there to make it easy to go in the forward and the reverse reaction, depending on whether you want it to release energy or absorb energy, um, given the particular situation. Now, when we're um, talking about electrolysis of molten salts, this links back to structure 2.1, under what conditions can ionic compounds act as electrolytes? Um, and that uh, there's two scenarios. One is molten, so hot enough that it is melted, it's liquid, the ions are free to move. Or when they're dissolved in water. When they are um, dissociating in water, then they are producing those ions, and that can conduct electricity as well.